people's come for today anyway. So. For today anyway, that's mm -hmm. right. Yeah. Good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Chloe Spencer. This is Tom and Cooper. Um, yeah. We're just here to welcome you this morning. We hope you're all enjoying the weather that we've been I waiting for. <laughs> we hope you're enjoying the weather that we've been waiting for for a long time. We've certainly been out in the garden all weekend Mommy. so far and look forward to that Mommy. again today. Um, Tom's got a bit of an announcement of something exciting that we were planning Mommy. for a couple of Mommy. weekends time. So on Saturday the 12th of next that. month um, we're planning on doing a small worship and waffles that. session just without the waffles. Um, so this is going to happen uh, like I said on Saturday the 12th. Um, it's going to be uh, obviously within the church and um, we're still trying to work out details at the minute for how many numbers of people we're going to be allowed and um, so what's going to happen is we're going to set up um, a page that you can sign up to um, if you would like to come along and more details about that um, will be told next Sunday and um, unfortunately obviously because of social distancing and the limited numbers that we can have in the church it is going to be first come first serve um, when the sign up happens so um, anybody who's wanting to come um, please look out for that next week um, and we will have the page and all the information of where you can sign up um, and hopefully um, we'll see some of you there um, we're also hoping by that point we might be in level one um, which means that the restrictions on singing might have been lifted um, so we're hoping by that point that we might be able to have some singing um, behind mass for the for the congregation as well. So, um, yeah, please look out for more information on that next Sunday.
Gadewch i ni weddio. Gaziach i ni weddio. Fader vår, du som är i himmelen. Helgat, vad är ditt namn? Kåh hej ben bai tam nam prathai kong praong. Myös maan päällä, niin kuin taivaassa. Geef ons heden ons dagelijks brood. Y perdona nuestras ofensas. Come noi le rimettiamo i nostri debitori. E nous laisse pas entrer en tentation. Es da helles namen kuldani. I bet va ju est zarstva. Takal quota on mest in el abad. Amen. While Jesus was giving his whole attention to the woman who had touched his cloak, there was a stir nearby where Jairus was waiting impatiently. Some servants had arrived from his house. They brought the message he had dreaded to hear. Your daughter has died, they told him. There is no point in bothering Jesus now. Poor Jairus, his heart sank. He had tried so hard to get to Jesus before it was too late. If only he had not stopped to talk to that woman. Surely she could have waited. It was no good now. But at that moment, Jesus turned from watching the woman and put his hand on Jairus' shoulder. Don't be frightened or worried, Jesus said. Go on trusting me. The two of them strode quickly towards Jairus' grand house. The hired mourners were already wailing noisily outside. What is all this noise about? Jesus asked them. The little girl is only sleeping. But they laughed at him. They knew she was dead. Jesus walked past them into the house. He gave orders that no one was to come into the little girl's room except her parents and his three close friends, Peter, James and John. Jesus went across to the still dead figure lying on the mattress. He took the cold white hand in his. Get up, little one, he said. At once, the girl opened big brown eyes and smiled at him. Then she was out of bed in a moment and hopping around the room in excitement. Tears were streaming down her mother's face. Jesus did not want the girl to be upset. He spoke quickly to her parents. Your daughter is feeling hungry now. Why not get her something to eat? Good morning, my name is Tony Stephen and I get to be the minister here at the West Church. Thanks for being with us and to everybody who has been involved already and has contributed, especially the Lieber family for putting that story together for us. I'm gonna tell you just one or two bits of news and then we're gonna hear a little bit more about International Justice Mission who we're focusing on for a few weeks um, at the moment. Uh, the first piece of news is just very sad news. Uh, uh, David and Maureen Kay, we told you about an anniversary they had last week, sadly this week, their daughter Fiona died. And so prayers for them and especially for uh, the family and her son, David. And um, also prayers with the family of um, Isabel Mackey, whose funeral was on Friday. Um, and we were able to, to celebrate together there, but uh, somebody who will be fondly remembered by all of us. And then a bit of good news. I'm going to share my screen with a photograph here. And this is from uh, Molly, uh, was Molly Wheeler, now Molly Bryce. So Molly, Molly Bryce, Molly uh, Clark. Um, and she has had a baby. Uh, Nora Jane Clark was just born this weekend to uh, Molly and to Bryce. And so congratulations to them. We had a fantastic time as Molly was an intern, a rookie, a youth worker with us. So that's great news for them. Um, we are focusing 
on international justice mission. We have um, for years now had a focus on the work they do in particularly in terms of bonded labor and human trafficking and also injustice around the world, taking it right from the investigations right to the aftercare and helping people to get back to the lives they were made for. So um, this Sunday, we're gonna hear an interview with some of the work that's been doing in Ghana. And then I'm gonna follow it up by a particular prayer. So IGM Ghana works alongside the government of Ghana to tackle issues of child trafficking, specifically in Lake Volta on the fishing industry. And the reality of child trafficking in Ghana is that um, it happens, so it's so pervasive within um, the country. Um, however, we've done a lot of work in terms of re raising and highlighting the issue. And so it's been really great to see change in terms of mobilization of our government partners to be able to seriously and actively tackle this issue where um, children are really being severely abused and exploited in this fishing industry. Yeah, so for me, what I always find difficult, it doesn't matter how many times we do uh, a rescue operation, but it's seeing this child for the first time and often in their facial expression, um, you can just see the sadness and the trauma that they've been through. Um, they would be so small and malnourished, but you'll see that their muscles and their arms from all the hard work that they've been doing. And when they talk of the work they've had to do, of the physical abuse that they've had to endure. Um, for me, that is just always so difficult. And it's, it's, it, yeah, that's really difficult to hear um, and see. Um, on the other side of it, what always brings me hope is the transformation we see in these children after a week, two weeks, a month um, of being in protective shelter. You just see them come out of their shell and start to play again and start to trust adults again, start to learn, go to school and learn and really start on that journey of healing and restoration. And when I see that, I just know that there is never, there is never a case where it's, hope is completely lost. Like there is always hope. There is always hope in every situation. A story of encouragement um, for me, and hopefully that would um, encourage everyone else, um, is one of a young boy called Gerald. And so Gerald was trafficked into a situation um, about two years ago, and he was just so miserable and hurting in the situation that he actually ran away and went onto a lakeside and was able, eventually able to get in contact with a social worker. And that social worker then contacted us um, to be able to help and support him. And although he was 16, he was so severely malnourished, the doctors were quite concerned um, about his weight. And so he was put in admission for quite some time. He wasn't very verbal at the time and he was diagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder. And it was, we had to locate his mother at the time to also put in place support. And so over a period of time, he's able to recover and gradually, yeah, gradually recover and gradually be in a stable state. And I'm happy to say that he's doing well in school. And once he got better, he actually gave us information on other children who were in situations similar to him. And through him, about 10 other children have also been brought to freedom. So um, that is really an encouraging and hopeful story that we hold on to. And I must say that all this happened last year through um, the situation of COVID. Um, and so our team still had to go out um, to fight this with all our protective gear. But we know that um, it was, despite our own fears and concerns, it was worth it to see this life being brought to freedom and many other children also being brought. And I really have to 
just praise the teams, my, the social work, um, legal and investigations teams for being so courageous and going out in these, in these tough cases. Thanks again to International Justice Mission for that. Um, as I said, we've become a freedom church, which means we highlight some of the work of International Justice Mission. There are ways that you can get involved. Um, I have, like a few people, had the privilege of actually seeing them in action out in Bangalore and in India and seeing just how effective um, the support that folk give can actually be on the ground. And it's often those of us who get excited about this think, what can we actually do? And in some cases, there are ways that you can actually serve with them. They have internships, they have vacancies around the world, they work all over the world. However, the most effective thing you can do to support the partners and the field offices and the work that's going on right across the world are two things. And these are the things they, they ask about. One is to pray. And the second is if you're able to give financially to back and to support the folk who are locally doing stuff on the ground. Get yourself aware, um, pray, and if possible, give in lots of of different ways. And so you can do that by searching up and looking up for the different links. Uh, but we're going to focus in prayer just for a, a very short time just now and another prayer that they've given for us for this Sunday. And we'll have a final one the next Sunday because we're having a big focus at this point. So let's pray together. Loving Lord Jesus, who was without sin, yet experienced the pain and the suffering of this broken world. We pray for those who commit such evil acts. Give them new and compassionate hearts that they would turn from their wicked ways and come to know your mercy and forgiveness. God of justice and compassion, bring transformation. Your kingdom come, your will be done. In Jesus' name, amen. So who does he think he is? I'm talking about Augustus, or should I say Caesar Augustus? Who does he think he is? He thinks he is the emperor, <laughs> the emperor of Rome, around about 2000 years ago in the ancient Near East. And that means for him, he's the ruler of the world or the known world of the time. He's the adopted son of somebody called Julius Caesar. You've probably heard of him. And Julius Caesar by this time is being worshipped as a god, which makes you, Augustus, the son of God. Not that you mention that too much, only when you march your armies through the streets, only in the inscriptions on the coins that everyone has to use, only on the statues that are placed on every street corner, only announced to the crowds at the games that try and entertain your subjects to distract them from how you are leeching the very goodness out of them in every country that you've occupied. You are the one who brought peace to the world, you're telling them, the one who is ruler of the world, the one who is the saviour of the world. This is you call your good news, your gospel. These are your brands. These are your catchphrases, your taglines. These are imprinted on all your subjects. Imagine then being one of these subjects, living in now occupied land, your home country taken over. And this branding imprinted on your mind every day your your whole culture that you've grown up with being ground away by these messages and the reality being that you are just part of well not just part of the empire machine you're being fed to the empire machine you're told that your worth is just measured in what you can give to the machine and, and you're just a number and a census is just a way of the empire marking down again 
where are its subjects where are its taxpayers where are the the ants the small pieces that feed the machine Imagine then, in the time of Caesar Augustus, meeting in a friend, a workmate's house, and hearing a story read out. That's a story about a man called Jesus of Nazareth, but you're told that that story begins in the time of Caesar Augustus, and you've already got both in your mind. Well, the writer of this particular version of the story, a man called Luke, is at great pains to ground what he's talking about in reality. For them, for him, this is history. Now he is a storyteller. He has collected material, but he's serious about it. And he's presenting a story about a man in a particular time and a particular place, Jesus of Nazareth. Who does he think he is? Well, we don't know yet. He's not even quite born. But Luke has given clues as to what might be going on in his story. He's mentioned an emperor who tells people he's the saviour of the world, that he's the son of God. He tells us that this baby is in a particular line, comes from a particular family of someone called David, one of the Jewish people's greatest heroes. Kings like David were marked, were anointed, a bit of oil put on their forehead to show that they were chosen by God, an anointed one. So as you listen to this story, you know that Mary, the young teenager who is expecting, isn't the only one who's doing some expecting. You're expecting great things. And then you hear that Mary had her baby and she wrapped him in cloths and she laid him in something called a manger, a feeding trough. It's a tiny detail, but it's important. It must be important because it's mentioned three times. There's actually a lot of things in the stories of Jesus' birth in the Bible that are not mentioned. If you look at the stories, there are no animals. There's no stable. There's no inn. And there's no innkeeper. None of these things are mentioned in the Bible. What is mentioned is a manger, a feeding trough, and it's mentioned three times, and a baby wrapped in cloths. What we're probably talking about is at a relative's house in Bethlehem where Joseph and Mary have travelled to. And it's probably the downstairs part of that house that maybe at some points of the year was used to feed some of the animals. And that's why there's a manger. What is it about a manger being mentioned three times? Well, Luke, as we've seen in the first couple of chapters of his story, is setting things up. He's already made us think about Caesar Augustus. He's made us think about an emperor. He's made us think about someone who called himself a son of God, the saviour of the world. And now he tells you about a teenage girl called Mary, a man called Joseph, and a baby wrapped and placed in a feeding trough. He's making us compare the two. The emperor with the nobodies. But something more is going on. We're expecting stuff. There are clues that, that are, this God is doing something. And doing something, and we already know this, in unexpected ways. Because this story is about all the things happening in completely unexpected ways, but at the same time being the kind of things that God has been doing and promising all along. This is a an upside do, down story. Luke is about reversing things. So there's another contrast to the emperor and the empire. The contrast that the first gospel, and that's a word the emperor used, the first good news is announced to shepherds. <laughs> Talk about low down on the job scale, on the status levels of the time. What sort of announcement is this to shepherds? And then the angel an angel, a messenger from God, announces this and terrifies these shepherds and says this is good news. Good news, not just for shepherds, not just for a young couple of nobodies, but good news for all the people. Luke is not subtle. This is a big story compared with a big brand, the emperor. 
The emperor's good news was telling you about power and peace and salvation. To be good, to be grateful, to behave. But this story is different. This story is pulling the rug out from under that. And Luke gives us more clues in three small words this time. The words that the messenger uses about this baby. A saviour has been born, the Messiah, the Lord. Just three words. But as you listen, you know there's more going on because that word saviour is a word that the emperor has been using all the time in his branding in the emperor machine. The word Messiah is a Hebrew word for an anointed one. The Greek word is Christ, an anointed one. That's how kings, priests, prophets in your Jewish faith are appointed, chosen by God. And this baby is the Messiah. Your hopes are tied up in this idea but they're fading as the years pass and as the empire grinds you down and then finally this baby is called lord a word that's used in all sorts of different ways but in your culture is used of god himself how how could god himself be involved how could this be a son of god right at the start Luke is clear that this is a different, unexpected saviour, a different, unexpected messiah, and a different, unexpected lord, a different son of God, but at the same time, what God has been doing all the time. This is upside down, this is reversed, this is a story that bursts all sorts of expectations, and maybe that's why this sign isn't a royal procession, procession. isn't an announcement at the games isn't a set of flaming letters in the sky but instead is a baby wrapped and laid in a manger and good news announced to shepherds of all people completely unexpected for those in the story but at the same time what this god has been promising all along if they were only aware a god who is working to move forward a much, much bigger story. How does this make us feel? How does this make us react? How does this make us respond? Because that's what Luke cares about more than anything else. That's what this God seems to care about, response. This baby, this good news, it made the shepherds shout and sing to God. It made all those who heard what was happening, we're told, amazed. It provoked Mary at the centre of it all to hold these things and to, to ponder at them, to wonder at them. Amazed. Wondering. Singing and shouting thanks to God. Where are you in this story? Did you? 
helping hopefully to think differently, hearing something at a strange time of year and helping us think about Luke's introduction to this life and death and resurrection story of Jesus of Nazareth. Let's pray. And now may the blessing of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit go with you all now and always. Grace and peace. Amen. Thank you for spending time with us. If you can stick around for a little bit, you'll be invited into a breakout room. Um, otherwise, do enjoy the sunshine today and thank you for, for joining in with what we are doing. <laughs> 